We're going to discuss a little bit about the idea of multiple comparisons, um, corrections, or multiple testing corrections. So we're going to do this in the context of one-way analysis of variance, although the, the idea of multiple testing correction applies to more than just um, one-way analysis of variance. So the general idea of this correction is that when we do more than one test or more than one comparison, our type 1 error um, rate starts to increase. So, for example, you'll recall that the alpha we use for our test is our probability of making a type 1 error, here a false positive. If we do one test here with an alpha of 5%, there's a 5% chance of making a type 1 error. If we do a second test with an alpha of 5%, that test also has a 5% chance of making a type 1 error. Combined over these two tests, there's going to be a greater than 5% chance of making at least one type 1 error. So this is the concept that we want to correct for. The more tests that we do, um, simultaneously, the greater chance there is for making a type 1 error. So we're going to learn a bit about how to control for that, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. So you'll recall, we worked through this example comparing weight loss on four different diets, comparing the mean weight loss over diet A, B, C, and D. Um, with an alternative hypothesis, at least one of the means differs. Okay, at least one diet has a mean weight loss that's different than the rest. To do so, we ran through a one-way analysis of variance. We calculated this F statistic, which was a ratio of um, variability in weight loss explained by diet to variability in weight loss that's not explained by diet. Right? Or variability um, that's happening between groups, variability within a group. And we had a test statistic of 6.1, a resulting p-value of 0 0.0011, and then this led us to reject our null hypothesis or conclude we have evidence to believe at least one mean differs from the rest. So now we need to decide which one or which ones may differ. So, in order to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to do all pairwise comparisons. Okay, And what I mean by that is we're going to compare diets A and B, diets A and C, diet A and D, B and C, B and D, and C and D. Okay, so we're going to compare all possible pairs of means. Um, mathematically, we can think of this, we have four different groups, and we're going to choose two of them to compare. How many different combinations of two um, groups can we pick from these four? And you might recall this ends up being four factorial over two factorial times two factorial, which equals six. Okay, six possible pairwise comparisons. And in order to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to use our independent two-sample t-test type approach. So we can do a t-test or a confidence interval, comparing each of the two pairs, A, B, A, C, A, D, and so on. So we can either look at the difference between group one and group two, plus or minus a t-value, and again this has some degrees of freedom, some confidence level, times the standard error for the difference in means. Or we can do the hypothesis test and calculate a test statistic that's going to help tell us how far is the difference in means we observed from the hypothesized value in terms of a standard error. And as noted, so here we're going to do six different pairwise comparisons, okay, six tests, and we've noted that as the number of tests we do increases, the chance of making a type 1 error increases as well. So we're going to start to work on the idea of how often will a type 1 error happen, and how can we try and reduce that rate. So to work our way through this, we're going to assume that each of these pairwise comparisons is independent of the others. That may not necessarily be a fully realistic assumption, but it's first um, it's going to simplify some of the calculations so we can focus on the concepts, and it's also a little bit more conservative. So let's start by thinking about what happens with each test. For each test, and by that I mean each of these individual comparisons that we're going to do, if we use say an alpha of 0.05, right, or 5%, then essentially what we're saying there is the probability of making a type 1 error on each test is 
Or we can think of it for each of these comparisons, each confidence interval, we're going to use confidence of 95%. And so again, if each of these tests has a 5% chance of making a type 1 error, the probability of not making a type 1 error on each of the tests is 95%. 5% right? chance of a type 1 error, 95% chance of not making a type 1 error. Now if we think over all of the tests, so over all the tests or all the comparisons, the probability of making at least one type 1 error And again, the problem of making a type 1 error here, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here. Okay, the problem of making at least one type 1 error, we can write as 1 minus the probability of making no type 1 errors. And again, the problem of making no type 1 errors, we can write this as 1 minus the probability that we do not make a type 1 on the test comparing A and B times the probability that we don't make a type 1 error on the test comparing A and C all the way up to the last one probability of no type 1 error on that final test comparing C and D. But again we can multiply them individually here um, because we assume each of these comparisons are independent. Right, so it simplified the calculation for us a little bit. Now, the probability of not making a type 1 error on any of the given tests is 95%. So 95% times 95% times 95%. And you're going to see we have that appearing six times. So if you work this out, it's going to come out to be 0.265 or 26.5%. So again, remember what we worked out there. The probability of making at least one type 1 error over all six of these tests is about 26.5%. Okay, so you can see how our type 1 error rate has inflated a lot with doing six comparisons, okay, or multiple comparisons. So sometimes this gets called the family-wise error rate or other names like that. So what we'd like to do is learn how to control this type 1 error rate so it doesn't inflate to an extremely large value. There's lots of different possible corrections that we can do. What we're going to talk about is one called Bonferroni's, okay, multiple testing correction. And we're going to do this for a few reasons. Um, the first reason is that it's the simplest to teach and understand. All the other possible corrections are the exact same in concept with slight changes in the mechanics. Okay, so once we understand Bonferroni's approach, we can understand that the other ones are pretty similar with some minor changes in there. So Bonferroni's approach is to use an adjusted alpha star Okay, and here we want to use the overall type 1 error rate that we want divided by the number of comparisons. Okay, we're here, 0.05, and we're going to do six different comparisons. So to use an adjusted alpha of 0 0.00833 okay, for each of the individual tests, or when looking at confidence, right, use 99.167% confidence for each of the individual confidence intervals. Okay, and let's see what that's going to do to the overall type 1 error rate. So again, if we use this adjusted alpha, that tells us the probability of a type 1 error on each of the individual tests is 0 0.0083, or 0.8%, or we're going to use 99.16% confidence over all the tests. And so again, a 99.167% chance of not making a type 1 error on each of the individual tests. So overall the tests, the probability of making at least one type 1 error is 1 minus the probability of making no type 1 errors. And here, we're using 0.99167. And if you work that out, you're going to find that it comes out to roughly 0.049 or 4.9%. Okay, so Bonferroni's correction suggests 
use an alpha of 0 0.0833 for each of the individual tests, or use 99.167% confidence for each of the individual confidence intervals to have an overall type 1 error rate of about 5%. So the probability of making at least one type 1 error over all six of these comparisons is roughly 5%. So if we were to run through and do all the possible pairwise comparisons building confidence intervals, we can see the confidence intervals for all six groups here, comparing group A to B, A to C, A to D, and so on. So we don't want to focus our effort on how to plug into this formula and run through these calculations. We can easily have a piece of software do them for us. What we want to do is focus on the concepts and the interpretations. So taking a look at these confidence intervals, we can see that there's only two of them that do not contain zero. We can see comparing group A to group C, the confidence interval does not contain zero, which gives us an indication there's a statistically significant difference between group A and C. Right, or we're not willing to accept the difference is zero. We can also see groups B and C are significantly different. Other than that, no other significant differences show up. So I'm going to draw a little diagram here that helps us think about um, the conclusions we're reaching here. So here we're saying we're confident that group C is significantly greater than groups A or B. Right? C and A are significantly different, and we can see that the mean for C is larger than the mean for A. C and B are significantly different, and again, the mean for C is significantly larger than it is for B. And I'm going to draw D here in the middle, signifying we're not convinced that C and D are different, we're not convinced that D and A are different. So I want to spend a moment here now just talking about um, some difficulties some people may be having with this conclusion here. I know when I first learned this material, I struggled a little bit with this concept. So some of you, your brain may be going in the direction if C is the same as D, and D is the same as A, isn't C the same as A? Okay, and that's true mathematically, right? If C equals D, D equals A, C must equal A. Okay, but we're not saying that here. What we're saying is we're not convinced C and D are different. Okay, that's not the same as saying that they're the same. We're saying we're not sure they're different. Again, we're not convinced A and D are different. We are convinced C and A are different. Now, to get at this idea, I also like to use an example that I think is a, an intuitive way to get at this. So suppose we'd all go out and do a 10 kilometer run. So we decide as a class, let's go out and get some exercise, run 10 kilometers, time ourselves, see who wins. Suppose that the person who finished first did it in 39 minutes. And our second place runner did it in 40 minutes. Now, um, without knowing too much about you know, variability in their race times, just trying to think intuitively, you know, I'm not convinced that the person who finished in 39, 39 minutes really is faster than the person who finished in 40. Right? If they ran the race on a different day under different conditions, maybe they'd switch places. Right? Only one minute separated them. Maybe that was a chance, um, chance variation or chance difference. Now, let's suppose that the third place runner did it in 42 minutes. Okay, again, I'm not really convinced the person who did it in 40 minutes and the person who did it in 42 are significantly different. Right? Again, if they run on different days, maybe they'd switch places. Only two minutes separated them. Maybe that was a chance difference. Let's continue on. Suppose the next person did it in 43 minutes. And again, we're not really convinced these two are different. Let's suppose the next one is 45 minutes, then 49 minutes, 51 minutes, and so on. Now, I'll tell you that I am convinced that the person who did it in 51 minutes is significantly slower than the person who did it in 39 minutes. Okay, and that gap is big enough that I think that that difference is real. You know, any two days these two run on, I believe this person will always be faster than that one. Okay, so that's what we're getting at here, that the distance between each of these might not be large enough to be convinced that it's real. Okay, the gap between these two is big enough that we think it's not due to chance. And that's similar to the conclusion we're reaching here. Okay, the difference we saw between C and D was not big enough for us to be convinced that statistically C really is larger than D. The distance we saw between the mean of D and the mean of A wasn't large enough to be convinced that we think they're really significantly different. But the difference that we saw between group C and group A was large enough to believe that we think statistically these are significantly different from one another. Now I just want to end on some important reminders here. 
The first is the idea of statistical, signif statistical significance versus clinical or scientific significance. Okay, so we've talked a bit about this um, through different videos, but just a reminder that because something is statistically significant doesn't necessarily mean that it's meaningful in the real world, right? So the difference in mean weight loss between these diets, um, while statistically significant, deciding if it's you know, um, scientifically meaningful um, is a question that requires context, looking at the actual effect size and the you know, numeric difference between the two, not just if it's statistically significant. Another reminder is the trade-off between the type 1 error rate and the type 2 error rate. When we increase one, we decrease the other. So just a reminder here that in controlling this type 1 error rate, right, and using a, a lower alpha to get a lower um, family-wise type 1 error rate, we're increasing the type 2 error rate. Or we're trying to make fewer false positives at the expense of we're going to make more false negatives. So just a reminder that there is that trade-off there. Another important reminder, this stuff generally we're going to do um, do the calculations using software. So we don't really want to focus our attention on the formulas or how do we plug things in. We show the formulas so that we can understand the concepts and okay, what it is a piece of software is doing for us. But a reminder, we don't want to put our focus on you know, what exactly is the T value we should be using and how do we find that in a table. Right? We can do all that with software. That's not the important skill to get through this stuff. And the final reminder, there's many different um, methods of doing multiple testing corrections. We talked about Bonferroni's. These other approaches are all the exact same, similar in concept. Some of the mechanics may change slightly. Thanks for watching our video. Subscribe to our channel. Share our videos. Stick around, guys, because we got lots more.